afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another episode of A Little Perspective with Angela and myself, Samyukta, as the, our, your co-hosts for season two. We are excited to bring you another episode and share a very interesting perspective from an HR expert who will be meeting with us today to talk about how um, employers can support people with disabilities and provide more access to employment. So Angela, why don't you take it away? Introduce our guest for today. Yeah, hello, hello. I am so excited to have Ms. Sheila Farr joining us today. Sheila and I go um, back a little while. We have known each other for a bit, um, been involved in a couple of book projects together, which has brought us much closer. She is a jack of all trades and a master of all of them. She has um, a Gulf Coast training and education center where she houses many different types of classes from management classes, yoga, kids yoga, um, paint uh, and sip type things and just a huge variety of really fun things and also her and her honey are um, gun experts and so she has just this wide range of knowledge but we have her on today to talk about her experience in the HR world and the human resources world you know as a human with a disability there are certain rights that we have, um, but beyond that, you know, I wanted to talk to Sheila about the human and human resources. She is an angel on earth. So Sheila, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Thank you for having me here. You're super sweet to say that. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you both again for having me to he here today. Uh, I'm Sheila Farr. I have a Gulf Coast training and education services here on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, uh, where we do a, a ton of everything, uh, primarily uh, business and management classes for small business owners and entrepreneurs. Uh, and because I have a 32 year, can't believe I'm saying that, 32 year history of human resources, uh, I really focus on helping people get their compliance issues straight, their employee handbooks, policies and procedures, those sorts of things. Uh, but the really neat thing is my experience has been very broad in those 32 years as far as human resources go. And I love human resources. I love people. Uh, I love education, probably love education more than I love people, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but uh, for human resources, I've worked for the military. I've worked in civilian personnel. I've worked in corporate personnel. I've worked in uh, small business personnel. I've done contracting personnel. So uh, you name it, I've done it. Everything from, from hiring to firing, uh, employee benefits to payroll to uh, EEOC and beyond. Um, so it's, it's one of, one of the passions that I have, because I think it's one of the things that makes or breaks successful organizations and definitely, um, successful and healthy, uh, work cultures. So mm -hmm. my, my job, as far as I see it is to make sure that the businesses that I have, uh, that come to me for help are positively impacted and are paying that impact forward in a positive way to the people that they employ. So thank you. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. That's a lot. And, and, and it's you, it truly is. So, you know, Sheila, why don't you just tell us just a little bit about EEOC, because you, you mentioned that, and I think that could be a foundation for some of our conversation. What is that? What does that mean? How does that look? Yeah, that's, that's a good place to start because I think so many people don't understand. They know that there are a lot of acronyms in the human resource field, but they don't really know what all of those things mean. So uh, EEOC is actually the organization that enforces ADA compliance. So they make sure that, um, that businesses are following the rules. So, and I should say businesses of 15 people or more, because it's very specific with ADA. Uh, if, if you are a smaller business with fewer than 15 employees, um, then it's employment's, employer's discretion as to which rules they follow, which is kind of, can be kind of tricky. So uh, EEOC is actually the organization that ensures that organizations are following the rules that the government sets for, for employment standards. Wow. Okay. So, and that stands for equal opportunity. Yeah. Right. Equal, equal employer opportunity commission. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, that doesn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. So as a person with a disability, um, I've grown up hearing that people can't turn me away 
from a job simply because of my disability. However, mm -hmm. my experience has been different than that. And then, you know, you have to kind of decide if it's worth prosecuting or whatever it may be, you know, mm -hmm. or if you just kind of take it on the chin and move forward, um, which usually that's what I have done during our conversation, um, right before we started recording, you talked about how diversity and inclusion is such a hot topic right now, but exclusion is not really as much talked about. And right. I feel like that kind of led to some of the decisions that I made when, you know, feeling like I was discriminated against, but deciding that it wasn't worth the battle because why do, I don't necessarily wanna to fight to be somewhere that doesn't want me. Mm -hmm. Um, so tell us your, you know, your thoughts on diversity and inclusion, exclusion, you know, so on. Yeah, this is a great time and a great topic. Um, I, I love this so much. So, you know, there's diversity, uh, which is the differences be between people or among people that are in an organization. Uh, and then inclusion, which is making sure that the people that are in the organization have the same opportunities that equal opportunities. So that's the inclusion part. But exclusion is what happens uh, when people don't have those things or um, they are, uh, they receive different treatment, not necessarily the opportunities, but the way that they're treated is different. It could be uh, through con condescending remarks or condescending uh, talk. Uh, it could be by excluding from things that are outside of work or other activities that are going on in the workplace or opportunities. Uh, and it could just be through bullying, you know, just because people treat you um, differently because you are different from them, regardless, you know, you might be somebody that wears glasses and you work in a place that doesn't wear glasses, uh, you know, and, and you, you get bullied around because you do, or, or right now, this is a great time for this uh, ageism is a big thing, you know, because we have so many uh, cohorts of, of generations working right now uh, at, a, at a time, this is really kind of a cool thing. So there's everything from, from baby boomers beyond in the workplace and, and how do you navigate those waters, you know, too, without having exclusion of things. So it's, and I think if, if you ask me at all, it comes all the way down to the employer. You know, you, you, it just really is, uh, how aware and how concerned the employer is with making sure that they're providing a healthy workplace for their employees. Go ahead, Angela. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so just like Angela, I also have um, a disability. Like we both have dwarfism and I'm going through the times like when I was, you know, applying, when I was get it going through job interviews and one of the things that like I you know struggled with was do I want to disclose my disability on the application or do I want to just wait until the interview see how they react see how the interview goes and then if I get the job you know then I can you know talk more about it disclose it and then request the accommodation so I kind of to be honest like experimented just to see like what would happen if I checked the disability box before? Do I get a call back? Will I, will, do I not? And it was definitely like hard because I definitely, there were times where I felt discouraged and I felt like I, no one is ever, you know, ex direct to, with you. You don't, you don't know if they decided not to hire you because of your disability or because of like those misconceptions. So I guess my question is, could you talk about it? Like, at the very beginning, when a person with this, a disability applies for a job, how can we make that process smooth for them and then so that they have what they need to get to the interview and also mm -hmm. to make sure that the employer doesn't go in with any misconceptions or judgments and just really has like an open, open minded perspective. Right. Well, the, the government's done that for us now already. I don't know how long it's been since anybody's applied for a job, but if you go online to apply for a job, now they have, there's a series of questionnaires that you have to do regarding your stat status as a veteran, regarding your stat status with disabilities, uh, and you can, and, and your gender. So you can choose to answer those questions or you can choose not to. Um, so, it, and it shouldn't have any bearing, but I will tell you, if you don't, don't answer that question and then you uh, get further down the line and you request accommodation, but you don't disclose that you have, you may have a disability because they word it in a way that says, 
uh, yes, I definitely do. And here's what it is. I may have one depending on what you define as a disability, you know, so if you're checking no, 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 no to all those, then, and then you show up and you're asking for accommodations, uh, they may or may not be able to do that. So it, honestly, I, I think being honest, this is me. If, if I see somebody come across my desk, I want to know as much about them as possible beforehand, uh, because I'm not really looking at all of that. I'm looking at your work experience and what our needs are, and do, do you have the qualifications? All of the other things to me are secondary because, um, because I'm going to send people through a panel of interviews anyway, because I'm not looking for the, for the best person just to, to fill this job. I'm looking for the best person to fit this team because we want to, we want to grow people and we want to grow teams and we want to grow in a way that is most uh, in line with our corporate values and the mission of our organization. So to me, I say honesty up front, being open and providing information. That way people know, because some people are actually looking to diversify their, their team. And if you don't disclose that, then you may miss the opportunity for not disclosing. So, Yeah, I was gonna ask you what your take on looking for those who check the box to fill those spots is because that's kind of a double-edged sword in some senses like it's great yeah. to know that you're going to have accommodations if you need them but you also don't want to be the token mm -hmm. person so you know what are your thoughts on that well I, I told you i'm kind of the different i'm kind of like the exception i think to hr folks when it comes to those things just because i i I've seen what happens when you don't have those conversations with people up front. You know, I, I don't want anybody, I don't want to bring anybody into a situation that's not going to be a comfortable fit for them. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to make that decision for them. I want them to make that decision. So, which is why anytime that I've been part of a hiring, uh, well, a hiring, if it's, if it's been my job in an organization to hire, I hire um, slowly. You know, I'm not a person who's going to just fill somebody, put a warm body in a seat. I don't do that because it costs organizations money to train people. Uh, that whole process can be uh, where a large portion of, the, of your profits go if you don't hire smartly. Uh, so you really want to, you do want to get a good fit for the job. You want to get a good fit for the organization. So understanding uh, the applicants, where they're coming from, what their needs are beforehand, uh, just helps me, you know, put them in a place because if you're if you're the HR person, uh, it's your responsibility, I think, to to talk with your managers and your leaders and your the owners of your business and understand uh, what mission you're trying to accomplish. As a as okay, we make widgets, you know, we want to make widgets, but aside from making widgets, we have a social responsibility of some sort, or we are supportive of different miss missions and what are those missions and how do we grow our organization to become better at what we're doing socially as well as what we're doing widget making wise. So uh, whenever I'm in a hiring situation, I talk to the people that I'm interviewing and let them know that, you know, so they can make that decision. Is this going to be a good fit for me or is this not going to be a good fit for me? So it really, um, honestly, the people that we hire come to us and, you know, they're either, yes, I'm on board, you're exactly what I'm looking for, or no, I feel like, or, or it seems like on paper, there might be a risk for me uh, to be uh, discriminated against, or maybe it's not a good fit, or you guys are just jerks and I don't want to be associated with you guys, you know, so it's not me making that decision, it's, it's, it's the applicant making that decision. Mm -hmm. And more often than not, I've truly seen that people will call me back and say, you know what, after talking to the group of people, that it's not going to work out for me, you know, so. Yeah. So when I was young, I was told that, um, it, and this is honestly, it's kind of toxic now that I look at it, but I was told that like, I could get a job anywhere. ADA requires that they, you know, accommodate you, even if it's uh, at a fast food place, if it's at McDonald's, you know, they'll have to make sure that you can safely and effectively do the mm -hmm. tasks that the other people do. Um, luckily, I never had to work in a place that needed like severe accommodations, you know, a step stool, you know, a chair, a comfortable chair or whatever, but I didn't have to 
really like put myself in a situation that could have been not safe, honestly, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, someone my size with my length of arms working the fryers is not mm -hmm. ideal. Um, but so how much truth, so to speak, is there to that thought that I should be able to get a job wherever? And I, I definitely keep in mind the exclusion, the inclusion that you just spoke of and how mm -hmm. we want to be a good fit for wherever we're going um, anyway. But, um, but you know, what, what, how, how true are those thoughts that like literally a place is absolutely required to accommodate you no matter what? Does that make sense? Um, My question makes it, sense. It does. Yeah. And from an HR perspective, um, I mean, I will say every place that I've ever worked has always been willing to do whatever they needed to do uh, to, to get the, the person, regardless of their ability, on board if they were a good fit for the job, you know, if they met the qualifications uh, and if they wanted to be there, you know, as long as that's what you really want to do, we'll find a way to make it happen for you. Uh, and the law says that's what all employers have to do. Uh, but then I think honestly, a lot of these questions are really go back to the to people as individuals. Do you really want to work in that environment? Is that really where you want to be? Do people have to accommodate you? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Same thing for elderly employees or veterans who have uh, some some uh, PTSD and, and other issues. You know, because uh, if you have trouble uh, speaking in public and you are applying for a job where that's you're, as a receptionist in an organization where your job is to greet people, but you have a, you know different types of people may trigger you uh, because of your past experience or trauma. Um, there's not a lot that an employer can do to prevent that, you know, so you have to, you have to really have discussions with people about the expectations of the job and their expectations and needs too. So, uh, but as far as what are the rules and the laws, yeah, you, you have to, and as far as, as far as what I've seen, uh, I've seen it happen, including the military uh, and, and civilian personnel. So uh, any of those government agencies definitely will. M most of the corporate employers will, and the small businesses do it because they they want to hire good people that will help their business grow. So they're willing to do what they need to do to get good people in. Yeah, that's the bottom line. Like it's about you know getting the getting the right people doing mm -hmm. the job, no matter what background, what abilities they have. And um, going off of um, Angela's point, in requesting accommodations, like in the ADA, it says mm -hmm. that employers are required to accommodate as long as it's like a quote, reasonable accommodation. Mm -hmm. And there, I just feel like the word reasonable is so ambiguous because what is un deemed to be unreasonable for an, for an employer, sometimes there are situations where employers feel like they can't accommodate depending on what the needs of the employee are, but according to that um, disabled employee, that's their life. That's what they deal with every day. That's what mm -hmm. they would need, those basic needs. How have you experienced um, situations where an employer wasn't able to accommodate? Um, and how, if employers run into that situation, like how can they navigate through that so that both the employer can, that the employer can provide and the employee can work? Yeah, I, I, I have seen it where they, ha they haven't been able to accommodate uh, because you have, to, and that word is there and it's that word for a reason, right? So it's, it's not to say, it's not, to, and I think it depends on which side you're looking from as to how you interpret that word. Uh, because if you're the person who has a challenge going into a job, then you're, you might feel like, you know, that they're saying, well, they have that word because they'll give it to me if they like me, you know, or, or if, you know, then they'll make an accommodation for me. But if they don't like me, that, that word gives them the opportunity to turn me away. Uh, and, and then it doesn't look like discrimination when in fact, uh, what that word's there for is to protect the people that are already in the workplace, you know, because there might be, uh, and I, I keep going back to ageism because that's what I have seen the most of. Uh, so people who are maybe a little bit older who don't know technology as well, you know, so they're struggling with that. So uh, I've seen places, workplaces, not be able to employ elderly people for those purposes, you know, so they just can't make the accommodation, uh, you know, getting somebody to help them with that part of the job or getting somebody else to do part of that job to kind of rewrite their job description. So it frees up, um, frees them up from having to do a lot of technical work, 
you know, they might be really good with people. And let's just think about the doctor's offices. I work with doctor's offices a ton. So um, you may be able to have an elderly person who's good at being a receptionist, but they might not be so great at uh, data input uh, and those sorts of things. So they might struggle with, with uh, operations, computer systems and things like that because uh, you're doing a lot of different things in there. You're having to go here and upload things. You're having to go over here and do things and pull things in differently. So sometimes uh, they can't make accommodations for, for those types of workers because they need somebody who can, can pick up on what the requirements are. But again, that just goes back to having those conversations beforehand and asking, you know, what specifically do you need? Here's what we can do. Uh, if, if, if there's a gap, can we fill in that gap? Is there a way that the two of us can come together and help you get into this position? Or is this something that either for budgetary reasons or just operations, uh, we can't do as an organization? So really just having people who are willing to, to find out what the, where the gaps are and, and fill those gaps. Did that answer your question? Is that? Yes, it, yeah. it did. I think, like you said, like, it's so important to, like, communicate, like, mm -hmm. communicate, just, like, be as honest and open mm -hmm. as possible, and, like, both parties want to be able to do that together, because, right. you know, it's, you know, you're becoming a part of a team, you're becoming a part of a culture, and this is going to be something that we all, everyone all wants to be on the same page, so, like, what I do is after I get hired, I just send an email to the HR director and um, I ask them, hey, this is just what I'll need. I'll need a step stool for the desk. I'll need, you know, maybe a higher, like a, an adjustable chair, like a, a seat, a backrest. You know, I just, you know, give them a list of things. I even sometimes even point to them a list, like, like a link to where they can just purchase something online. And the HR director says, okay, we will have this for you when you come. So it's sometimes a simple email can like, you know, make the, make yes. the most difference. And it, it does. And you're, that's wonderful that you're proactive like that and help you. Yeah. And people, you have to tell people what you need in order for them to be able to get it for you. Uh, but, but I think like going back to the, the word, um, the, the, that reasonable yeah. accommodation, you know, so if you have, so you, let's say you're coming in and we, and and we have your step stool, we have everything that you need, but there are, have been three other employees there that have back, back problems and they've been asking for those things for months and nobody's ever gotten those things for them. You know, now uh, that's what employers really are afraid of. You know, it's because they, they can't do it for everybody, so they don't do it for anybody, you know, and I think that's the wrong way to do it, you know, but just kind of showing you where where employers heads go sometimes because it's it's always about the bottom line or at least it appears to always be about the bottom line you know can they financially afford to do these things you know how much is it going to cost them for those accommodations uh they really do look at those things and in some places make decisions based on budgetary you know requirements or restraints so that's and that's a bad thing too because that does cause uh inequality in the workplace a lot so I could see though that your encouragement to be open and honest and forthcoming and then Sam Yukta's style of just saying, hey, this is what I need, could honestly settle some of that fear because a step stool, a cushion, a chair, you know, those really aren't going to cost the company that much mm -hmm. if they feel like this employee is the right fit. Because like you said, there's so much cost involved with training and so on and finding the right person that it's it's better, wiser to invest a couple hundred dollars in yeah. accommodations for someone who is gonna likely stick around versus, you know, passing them over and then hiring someone that may not end up being a good fit for the long mm -hmm. run. Cause then you've wasted more than the couple hundred that those simple accommodations mm -hmm would cost but I you know I have grew up to be modest like I was raised to be like hesitant to demand things and so even when I was at Habitat you know they had stools for me and everything they um got um for the company vehicle they uh purchased uh extensions pedal extensions and you know and and I felt like a burden for it and, and they didn't make me feel that way it was just it was just my nature to feel that way and so I think 
that I do see the next generations, and, and I know we've talked a little bit about ageism, but the younger generations being a little more um, comfortable in asking for things, I guess, because it's part of their normal day-to-day, -day, whereas mm -hmm. it's not so much a part of, hasn't always been a part of ours. But mm -hmm. um, ageism is, is an interesting you know, thing as well, because it's absolutely, a concern. Um, and I think that there are some organizations that could help with those kinds of things. I know locally on the coast, on the Mississippi coast, we have the Agency for Aging, and they mm -hmm. tend to help older people find jobs that do fit them. And that can be yeah. a, a mutual beneficial, you know, thing. And so, um, you know, would you mind sharing just a little more about ageism, since that's not something that we've really talked much about on this um, podcast? Yeah, because I mean, you think about it, they're the same, there are so many demographics of workers that have, I mean, they're excellent workers, and they're good people, but they have special, you know, needs at to in order to get to meet the job or get the job done. Uh, so it's important to, to be sure, I mean, I, the basic thing for me is just communicate with each other. You know, what is it that you need? We, 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 you have the qualifications. You're an awesome person. When we're interviewing you, we'd love to give you an opportunity. Uh, where do you see, you know, and I always ask people, where do you see yourself? You know, where do you want to be? Because I want to put you where you want to go. Because if I'm giving you an opportunity to do something that you love to do, you're going to rock and roll and you're going to just, you know, you're going to stick with the company and you're going to help us grow and, and everybody's going to, going to be, raised up together. Um, so I think, uh, especially for the older employees, it's just saying, okay, what do you want to do? What are, you know, what, can, where can we put you? What, what are your, what hours can you work? You know, some people don't like to drive in the dark, right? Some people, so, but they can still, you know, work during the day or have a morning shift or, you know, what, what, are, what is it that you're able to do and what are you willing to do is the other thing. Uh, and, and, Honestly, I always encourage, and my, my co-HR directors along the coast, they laugh at me because I really, I just ask people questions uh, because you can't ask people, so what's your age? You can't ask people, what you, you know, you can't ask them some things. So I always say, then tell me, tell me what you can do. I can't ask you, can you do this, this, or this? So what, what are you willing to do? What are you looking for? Because if I know what you're looking for, then I can get you to a position that I know is going to best accommodate those needs. Um, and those abilities, you know, I don't look at what you can't do. I look at what you can do, you know, so, so let's get you into the place where we can put you in a place that's going to welcome you and going to give you opportunities to grow. Um, you know, so like we just did a series of, uh, employment fairs for special demographics here on the coast of so high school students, seniors, veterans. Um, so I just went to employers and I was like, okay, look, I'm looking for jobs for senior citizens. Uh, people who might not be able to see well, people who might not have great technology skills, people who, um, you know, only want to work a couple of hours a day. Are you hiring for those jobs? What positions do you have that that, that type of person might feel? Yeah, we've got these jobs. Uh, mail room, come work in the mail room, come be a bank teller, come do this. You know, these are things that, that don't require uh, a, a ton of those things. You're not going to have a ton of technology. You're not. You can come in the morning. You can go before dark. You know. So good. Let's let's get those seniors in there. So and then the same thing with uh, with veterans. So we have some veterans that don't want to work in in big groups of people. They want to have uh, jobs where they can be auto You know, have a ton of autonomy and just do their job. Again, mail rooms, being a security person. Uh, there's tons of things that people can do. So it's just matching the needs of the employee with the, the employer, just putting them together. And when you, you have conversations about the abilities instead of the disabilities, it works so much easier. It's so much better for everybody. I will tell you from the, the when you just mentioned security person. So mom and I just had a little staycation at a local casino. We're not gamblers, but we got a, a friend of hers got us a room. And so we stayed for the weekend and it was just a really great time for us to just kind of spend time together without the kids and we met the most lovely security guard she was full of spunk and personality I love that. she's definitely well into her 60s if not older I mean she's she was beautiful but you know she was older and 
And you could tell that she enjoyed talking with people. But like you said, there wasn't, and I just, I never thought of this as like, mm -hmm. you always think the Walmart greeter, right? right. And, and that, and, and while there's nothing wrong with that position, it's not enough for some people. Some right. older people yeah. want more, understandably. And, and so I love the, you know, I love the like, okay, think bigger, think wider. Like mm -hmm. what else is there that doesn't necessarily require X, Y, Z, you know, you know, and so it, it's just, it tickles me that you mentioned because she like, that was, that is her, she was made for that position. Mm -hmm. She was absolutely made for that position. Like she, she yeah. you know, and, and the value that she brings to the company is, is huge. You know, it, it's right. great for her, which is, mm -hmm. you know, what we're talking about. We want the employee to have a satisfying quality of life with the job that they choose, but right. she's also bringing right. so much value to the organization because like we like that's my biggest takeaway from this weekend is this like really fun conversation that we had with her so uh I love that thank you so much for mm -hmm. sharing that yeah for sure and yeah. and and you probably uh would know that the she would appreciate hearing that too so you know maybe you write into the to the place where you went and stayed and say just give her a shout out because I don't think we do that frequently enough you know, I don't think we do that often enough because, uh, you know, it's that's another thing that I really foot stomp uh, with employers is be sure that you're appreciating your people, right? Because you know, you're a human resource person. So be sure that anything that you hear that's good, be sure it gets back. We always hear the bad things and we always focus on the bad things because we're always worried about performance evaluations and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but what about the times when people do something stellar? You know, like I, I, I'll never forget this. There was... A, again, doctor's office, back in my doctor's office days, uh, our front office receptionist, uh, she was running out and getting people uh, from their car. It was a rainy day and she would take her umbrella out and, and escort them in. And I'm like, oh, that is so awesome. You know, I mean, and I've worked a lot of front desks, but I can tell you, I probably never would have done that, you know, just because I was so focused on the job and she was focused on the people, which is so much better to, you know, to be. And that's exactly who you want in those areas of welcome, you know, those reception areas. So absolutely. Uh, I, I love it when I hear stories about that too, but yeah. So uh, special demographics of people, uh, as long as you're putting them in places that you know, meet their needs, I think they're going to just soar and do well. And I wish more of our employers would do that. I wish more companies would do that, would make that part of their core, core, core values, uh, you know, that we're going to find the best people, period, not, you know, not regardless of or in spite of or but or that or anything. We'll find the best people. Uh, because if you find good people, um, you can do whatever you need to do to meet the needs to make things happen. And then it just, it makes the whole organization grow and it makes, I mean, you spend so much time at work. Why would you want to make the workplace miserable for everybody? I never understood that. So, yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like not only like these employers are investing in these, in, you know, the right people, the people they're making investment in their, their time of their life, of their contributions right. they make in the company. And it's all about like, like, like you said, being, being valued, being um, recognized. And those are the mm -hmm. people that will stay if they ha get that positive feedback. And, and um, on top of that, I was just thinking about like how COVID, you know, the COVID pandemic has affected the workplace and, you know, specifically people with disabilities because the world has become remote, the mm -hmm. world. And it has, you know, impacted people with disabilities in so many ways, but especially, but they have the opportunity to work from home now because it's the home has their home has been set up for their life to, to for their daily tasks whatever daily needs they have and they have their home set up to, to be able to do their job in that safe environment for them and what i've noticed is that a lot of employers are trying to go back to the office and which impacts people with disabilities because like they they have everything they need at home. So getting them back to uh, another, the work environment, having them adjust, it's, I've seen how difficult it is for them. And especially when there's employers where, if business is still happening, if business is still going well, if it's productive, if everyone's doing their job, if, if, if there hasn't been any like setbacks working remote, why, 
well, I go back to the office. I understand there are, you know, costs, there's buildings that you want to, you know, that you want, don't want to lose money on, but it's about the people. So could you talk about like the impact for people with disabilities in COVID and when it comes to the workplace and how um, they can make sure they can still get what they need if yeah. employees, employers have to go back to the office? This is, I, man, I, I'm going to sound like a complete knucklehead, but um, the thing that the positive thing about COVID is it showed us what we are capable of doing. Uh, you know, it, it forced employers to become innovative and do things um, that they never thought they could do and still make profits in business. Um, so a large part of what I do now is talk to companies about how to blend those teams, how to blend the remote teams with the teams that are in office uh, and, and how can you make it work for the people that want to stay home? You know, can you make it work for the people that want to stay there or that need to stay there for whatever reason? Um, I mean, and it, it's my opinion, if, if you can make it work, make it work. If you can make it work, make it work. And I know that people uh, talk about um, we, we need human connection. It's so much better when we all can be connected. But I think if you talk openly and honestly, uh, communication is communication is communication. You know, uh, and, you know, that, so that's me. Yeah, I, I'm thinking if, if you can make it work, make it work. If you can't make it work for whatever reason, um, just be sure to, to really look at it and make sure that it's for the reasons that you're saying. Uh, just be honest with your workers. It's what I always tell the employers that I work with. Uh, if, it's, if it's a financial thing, let them know why, you know, tell them why. And then what can you do? Is there, you know, you did it before, so is there a way that you can make that accommodation still? Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot that can be resolved if we just talk to each other and, and educate each other on the reasons why, you know, just, just again, the, the expectations, uh, the reasons, and then, you know, looking for the, for the things that we can do as opposed to the things that we can't do in business. Uh, because it, I, I think, man, it changes a lot. And mindset, you know, is a big, big deal. Um, especially the, the mindset of an organization. If you're working at an organization that is like, this is the way that we do it because this is the way we've always done it. Um, you know, maybe that's not where you want to be after all. So, you know, I think that, that um, shoot, I literally just lost my train of thought. Oh my gosh. That's so how that the would, I'm going to scream. I love innovation. I like changing things. I don't like change, but I like change uh, that makes things forward, that moves things yeah. forward, uh, and that moves people forward. Because to me, there's nothing better in the world. So as a teacher, to me, there's nothing better than seeing um, a student connect with a concept that they just didn't get. Or, or realizing, oh my goodness, if I do X and Z, then Y happens, you know, or, you know, yeah. those aha moments is what people call them, I think a lot of times. Uh, yeah. So in, in, in education, when you see that happening, it's such a beautiful thing as a teacher. So in business as well, whenever I see those, those organizations uh, really focus on op making opportunities for people in, in things and uh, new revenue streams or anything like that, you know, to me, those are the greatest times because there are always, if, if something is within your wheelhouse, if this is what you do, and if, and if this is who you say you are as an organization, then isn't it your responsibility to, to, to the best of your ability, uh, meet those needs and do those things, not just say those things. Uh, it, it used to always get on my nerves when, when people would say, we're the best, we're, you know, our business is the best, we're the best in this, you know, saying the best, saying that you're the best doesn't make you the best of anything. Being the best is what makes you the best. So if you're, if you're an organization that says that you uh, value people, then you ought to be doing the things that prove that you do value your people. <laughs> so, which is a, uh, uh, meeting them halfway on things whenever they need accommodations for things, uh, providing the resources that they need and paying them fairly. That used to be one of my biggest pet peeves is people would ask for a raise and an organization would say no, but let them turn in their resignation and then they want to come back and give them a raise. 
And I'm like, if they're worth it today, they were worth it three weeks ago when they asked you for it, you know, so don't be mad because somebody's leaving your organization for a higher rate of pay. They gave you an opportunity to do better and you chose not to. So now they're doing better. <laughs> so you shouldn't, you can't be mad about that. So I think another thing, I remember what I was going to say. I think another thing um, that the stay at home work has opened up is the opportunity to have um, disability um, payments uh, mm -hmm. from the from the government in in conjunction with working part time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times there's not a lot of knowledge that that exists, that that program exists. And I see so much benefit to the individual, but also to the employer to be able to utilize those kinds of employees, you know, of course, if it fits, you know, but if someone is um, able to have a work from home employee, and then they're able to pay them part time or have them part time where they don't aren't required to provide full benefits. But then it gives that employee, that person an opportunity to work and feel like they're contributing to society because I think and we're kind of getting into the you know feely part of disability but I think that there's a huge misunderstanding or uh, assumption about people who are on disability you know that the majority of people that I have known or have encountered that have um, been granted disability payments from the government don't want to just not work. That's not their desire. Their desire is to work, but unfortunately the world has not really provided them with very many options. And so this is their way to live is to be able to. And so, and, and it's tough and it's tricky and it's a fine line and, you know, the government is the government and always will be, but pardon me, I think that that has kind of been um, one of the better, like you said, there, COVID has really shown a light on a lot of positive things, you know, not at all discrediting or trying to be callous to the people who have suffered or right. um, have lost lives. But, you know, in, in other senses of the word, there really have been um, awarenesses that have come mm -hmm. about. And, and one of them, I think, is working while disabled and, um, and the benefits that that can provide uh, to the person to have uh, a purpose, um, but then still be able to keep their medical benefits because in all fairness, most corporations aren't going to be able to provide the medical benefits that someone with a severe disability truly needs. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's also that kind of gray area as well. Um, and I don't know if you, and, and I didn't prep you for that. So I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, if that's something you want to share. Yeah, I, I love that you brought that up because I think that there are so many agencies out there. Uh, first of all, there are so many opportunities that people don't know how to find. You yeah. know, there are so many things that people can do, but they don't know that these programs are out there. So how can, how do we as a, honestly, I think, on, I think it starts small in your community. I'm just, I, my big thing is make, just make connections with whoever you can make connections with in your, in your community that are doing similar things that you're doing and, and ask about, you know, do you know of any special programs? Do you know of anybody that's doing this? And then just share that information with as many people as you know, because there are so many organizations that are trying to help. Uh, and people don't know, like I just even learned that uh, there, there was a, a law passed for long-term COVID uh, patients. So as long as you have uh, a diagnosis of long-term COVID, you know, if you have those recurring headaches and if you have uh, the shortness of breath and things that prohibit you from walking for extended periods of times or things like that, there's a whole list of things. There's a whole list of help that's out there for patients, people, employees that have long-term COVID uh, and, and it falls under the ADA rule. I did not know that, uh, you know, so, and I'm an HR person. So, you, you know, it's like just getting the information to help in, into the hands of the people that need it. Uh, and, and I, I, you know, you got to really have to give a shout out to the, to the, 
employee assistance programs that are out there for people because they they do a great job of connecting you know people with those programs so i would say to anybody who's working in a, in a corporate organization or a government agency uh seek out you know your employee assistance folks and ask about those things because you might be eligible for things that you didn't even know you were eligible for so ask and um yeah i just there are tons of things out there, but to me, the, the question is, how do you get the information to the people? So, because there's there's so much, we, we listen to so many things that aren't true. <laughs> and we, you know, because we don't know, we can't find our way to the resources. And Angela, yeah. I'm like you, I know a ton of people that are, are on disability that would much prefer to be working. Right. Uh, you know, and I, and I know a lot of people that are working that have really bad opinions about people that yes. that are on disability because yes. they don't know better and I'm sure you know that they prefer not to be home with fibromyalgia I'm sure you'd much rather be at right. your job that you hate instead right. of being home with fibromyalgia you know just hurting every yeah. single minute of every single day um yeah. you know so people just need to like you said use their heads and you, you, then you kind of get into the touchy-feely parts of things and people and why they behave the way that they do uh but I, I mean I, I think for anybody who's out there listening to this program and you're wondering what's out there for you, start small. Uh, call call your local government and just ask about, hey, are there any programs for people that, whatever your yeah. situation might be, uh, and just start asking those questions in the community and watching uh, to see where you can find those answers. And COVID really has has turned the tables in a lot of ways. Yes. And you know, Obama mm -hmm. put in a lot of um, things that and that helped to solidify the ADA because nothing's perfect. And the ADA has kind of been the benchmark. But even Sam Youthen, I can tell you that there are ADA laws that don't do us a bit of good because they're yeah. focused on wheelchair users, right? Yeah. And so, and and while obviously that's great, like it's great to have a starting point, but we have to be proactive. And mm -hmm. so I think finding organizations in your area can really make a difference. Disability rights is usually a great starting point for most mm -hmm. places. Um, yeah. yeah, that was awesome, yeah. 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 Kudos to you ladies for talking about these things. Uh, a lot of people don't yeah. talk about it because it's so it brings up so many different emotions and it's so awkward to have these conversations. Right. But you have to have these conversations. Otherwise, things don't get fixed. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you want to make it you want to make it work for everybody. You know, you want to bring everybody along. Uh, you know, you want to save lives and save uh, hearts and save people and save organizations. Um, and the only way to do that is to have these crazy conversations that do not make sense and are really kind of awkward. And because we don't all see same things the same way because we're looking at them from different perspectives. So uh, I'd love a little perspective and, and, you know, making sure that that we everybody's voice gets heard, you know, because there, there are always reasons. So understanding those reasons why we do or don't do things is, is incredibly important, I think, in, in making healthy work cultures uh, and having mentally well people, period, in, in a society, so. Yeah, thank you so much, Sheila, like just for sharing like all the, those pieces of information and just to be, how we could be very open and honest and just listen, have, have these conversations. Um, I wanted, I wanted to share like a little tidbit going off of Angela's um, comment. So like in Illinois, for our listeners, uh, disabled listeners from Illinois, we have a really good resource organization called Equip for Equality. I've had to actually like rely on them for a, a discrimination issue that I faced when I was requesting accommodations for a hotel room. So it's not related to employment, but it's still, you know, requesting mm -hmm. accommodations and the ADA, you know, says, you know, that public places of needs need to provide accommodations as long as it's, again, they have the reasonable accommodation, but I, the only accommodation I requested was a step stool and I had to, you know, really push, push with hotels to, to get the basic amenity for me. What's, what, pe what employers and, you know, public places don't understand is that, it's nothing to them, like, but it's everything to us. Like, it's something that we need to survive and they don't understand. And that's what's important that they should know about. And like what Angela said about like, what may work for a wheelchair user, like the ADA does have components where it needs to be reformed, like restored, like if there are out, 
outdated, you know, pieces of laws in there that need to be improved to fit, you know, the current times. And so like what would what's needed for a wheelchair user may not be conducive for us. So I've had and, you know, and I have instances that where employers may try to feel like they're being helpful going above and beyond to make sure that I have my needs, but then they would not really think about, okay, does this work for me? Because everyone has different needs. And mm -hmm. so I was actually booked like an ADA compliant room, but the room is equipped for wheelchair users. So it wouldn't work for me. The sinks is still very high, like the shower maybe is roll in for a wheelchair user, but I, I can't use it. So that's so that's like another thing where like everyone needs to communicate and where everyone needs to like just be on that same page and listen, listen, just really not hesitate to open up. So my last question, what I wanted to ask you since we're getting to the wrap up is, is there anything that you would like to share to our viewers, to our employers, how they can be better what they can do better to support people with disabilities and how they can be better allies. Um, yeah, I would, for employers, I would say just because you're hiring a diverse population of people doesn't make you uh, an inclusive organization. Um, so, you know, just be sure that whenever, that you're doing it for the right motives. Uh, a lot of people do things for show and to check those boxes. So I would say just, for employers, be sure that you're hiring uh, for the right reasons and that you, you are making room and making space for change in your organization and encouraging people to have open conversations and honest conversations about things um, and listening, not just having those conversations, but I think uh, really listening and making changes in organizations for people uh, of all sorts of demographics of people, not, you know, not just based on size, but, uh, you know, gender and every, all of the things that we're encountering now in our, in our society as, as change takes place. Just be sure that you're uh, keeping your mind and your heart and your uh, door open. That would be the thing that I would say. And then for people that are out there looking for opportunities, um, just be, be willing to be more open, uh, you know, because I know when I know when you've faced discrimination or you've just, you know, you've experienced experienced that it's hard to, I mean, it's easy to close up and not, and just kind of be invisible, <laughs> you know, or like try to not to make waves in an organization or try not to make waves at all because you just want to be normal. You just want to be normal. You know, you just want to be accepted and get in there. Uh, but really, I would say be open and be uh, unapologetic about the things that you need uh, to do a good job. If you can do a good job and you know that you can kill something and you have a burning desire to do it, talk about it. Don't be afraid to, to tell that hiring manager, you know, who you are, what you can do and what you need in order to get your job done. Um, so I think as long as we're having these conversations with each other, uh, we're bringing these points up, we're looking in our community to find out where we can make a difference. Uh, and we're just banging on doors and beating down walls. I think, you know, change is going to come. It might come slowly, but my goodness, look how far we've come in just three short years, how, how different things are. So uh, again, I, I admire both of you and I uh, just kudos to you and thank you for the work that you do uh, for for breaking down walls and educating people. So thank you. Thank You're you for the time. Stop. <laughs> oh. You're making me cry. Don't stop. Thank but I think I think that um, some of my takeaways have been to be vulnerable and be honest and the value that that brings to the greater good, um, which you know, sometimes it's hard to, sometimes we're in survival and sometimes it's not about the greater good, but sometimes when we are able to talk about the elephant in the room, then that makes it easier for the next time that someone comes behind us. And, you know, then, then the facilitator is more likely to already have an idea of what that person's thinking and they can more authentically address those things. Because I think sometimes there's a hesitancy to talk because it's touchy and they don't want to be seen as asking, like you said, I can't ask you how old you are, but you know, I can ask you what 
accommodations you need for whatever your needs are. And, and so I think that there's a lot of value in, in that. And then um, I also love to use the pendulum um, analogy in just about everything, because as far as it's swung in one way, it's going to have to swing in the other, and then eventually it's going to settle. And I think that um, with accommodations, with working at home and that kind of thing, we're going to find a, a settling point where employers are able to see that the person with a disability is not a liability, that they're an asset. Yes. And it's because of who they are and what they bring versus the what they cost them as a, you know, as a person with a disability. Yeah. And the more that we can be boisterous about our needs, the more that those needs can be met for not just us, but everyone and ageism, wheelchair users, other types of disabilities, mental disabilities even can all uh, fall in line with that. So, so good. This has been so good. <laughs> I agree. So informative, so enlightening, and just so validating. Yeah. Because like we see like, like, to hear from you, Sheila, and just knowing that like, hey, you're supported, we want to help you. So I just really hope, wish that other employers can, you know, fall in line with that and that other, you know, other people with disabilities can thrive in the workplace. Yeah. It's not just about those basic things. Okay, you're in. No, they deserve, we deserve to thrive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Awesome. Sam, you think you have any last questions for our yeah. amazing Sheila Farr? No, none for me, but uh, Sheila, we'd love to hear like if there are other ways of how people can get in touch with you. Uh, if there's a website, we'll be sure to put that in the comments and in the when we post your interview. But thank you again so much for your time. No, thank you both. Um, yeah, just my website is, uh, is the easiest way to get to me. It's long. It's <laughs> www.gulfcoasttraining.org. Uh, but anybody can get to me through there. They can see we have classes. I have a ton of free training, especially if you're an HR person. Uh, honestly, I have a training coming up July 1st is a virtual training on uh, diversity and inclusion. So for anybody who doesn't know what that is or understand how you can make that a priority in your workplace, uh, it's, it's coming up the 1st of July. So, but there are other free training courses, leadership courses. Uh, so I would encourage anybody, especially if you're an employer and you're hearing this and she's like, and you're like, that lady is making me, making my life difficult. <laughs> so I would encourage you to contact me and I'll be happy to help you like navigate through those <laughs> things because I know a lot of HR people really do struggle uh, with trying to, to, to help in, in, because they're taking it from all sides. So yeah. how do you navigate that? I'm happy to, to, to share what I know and, and what I've learned in my 32 years of doing this. So happy to. Sounds great. Yeah, that was so great. Thank you so much, Sheila, for your time. And it's funny because I think I probably asked you to do this three times and you were like, yep, I'm already on the schedule. <laughs> but I was just so excited about the thought of you sharing, you know, your thoughts, your perspective. Um, I feel like I use that word too much, but it's so valid. And, you know, it's such a topic out nowadays with diversity inclusion and just really kind of getting behind what that really means and understanding the the human and human resources mm -hmm. and I love the way you say that so yeah. thank you Sam Yukta for mm -hmm. being an amazing co-host and asking all the right questions and Sheila again we so value you the website is below. So, you know, if anybody wants to reach out to her, please feel free. She does in-person classes on the coast, but she also does virtual stuff as well. And this woman's plethora of opportunity <laughs> does not have any end. And so please just follow her, follow her page, um, because really it's good stuff in any little bit, um, helps, right. Any little bit of skills that we can add to our repertoire helps. So, Thank you all so much for being here with us. I love all of you and I hope you Thanks, have everyone. the best day. Bye. Take care.